Good evening. <clears throat> Mr. Evans here with The Sugar Creek Gang by Paul Hutchins. Tonight we are starting with chapter 12. Did I tell you that we nearly always went to town on Saturday nights? We had to, you know, to buy groceries and things. So when we were dressed, Pop called and soon we were driving along in his car toward town, which was about five miles away. Now don't you get into any mischief, Pop said to me when we stopped in front of the big spraying fountain on the main street of our town, and I slid out of the car and ran over to where Poetry and Dragonfly were waiting for me. Hello, Bill, they said. Hello, Dragonfly. Hello, Poetry. They were both wearing their Sunday clothes. We stood watching the water spraying down from above and falling into a big cement pool right in front of us with electric lights shining down on it from lampposts all around it, and you could see maybe a dozen goldfish swimming around in the pool. Say, with water splashing and the band playing up the street, and hundreds of people standing around talking and laughing, and especially with poetry and dragonfly there, all of us liking each other a lot, it seemed, to be, it seemed good to be alive. I wonder if it's deep enough to swim in, poetry said. And I was thinking the same thing, and so was Dragonfly. And do you know we had to go away and quit watching that fountain on account of it made us want to go swimming so bad it made us feel sad all over? We started walking along Main Street with Poetry in the middle and with Dragonfly and me on each side of him, when all of a sudden Dragonfly said, Psst, just like he always does when he's seen or, seen or heard something important. So we stopped quick to find out what it was. It's Circus's dad, he said, and sure enough, it was. I hope he hasn't got a gun, I said, remembering he was always carrying one when he went hunting, and he was an awful good shot. He kept shuffling along, reaching out with each foot like he was having trouble finding the sidewalk. Let's follow him to see where he goes, po Poetry said. And we did. And pretty soon he staggered up to a place where they sell beer and kind of fell against the door. Then he pushed it open and went inside. We stood there looking in through the smoky glass door panel and saw him lean up against the bar and throw down some money and say something to the bartender. It made me sad to see him there when I knew Circus's folks were poor and needed all the money they could get for food and clothes and things. We were glad little Jim wasn't with us, because he would have felt so bad about it, he liking circus so well, he wouldn't have had any fun at all. As it was, it kind of took away the good taste of the box of Cracker Jack we were eating right that minute. Well, we went on walking around feeling kind of sad when pretty soon we saw Circus himself sitting alone on a bench in front of an empty store building, looking like he'd lost his best friend. Hello, Circus, I said, and Poetry and Dragonfly said the same thing. We offered him some of our Cracker Jack and sat down beside him. What's the matter, I asked, but he didn't answer. He just kept sitting there looking sad, not even taking any of our Cracker Jack. I noticed he didn't have on nearly as nice clothes as the rest of us, but they were clean and neat. His shoes were old too, but he had them pretty well blacked and they looked all right. He had a very good mother. Wait a minute, Dragonfly said, and he got up and ran down the street and came back with a big bag of fresh popcorn, knowing Circus liked popcorn better than anything. But he didn't take any, and we didn't try very hard to make him. We all sat there feeling sad, none of us saying anything for a long time. Pretty soon Circus said, Pa's at it again. Then he sighed and took some of my Cracker Jack and Dragonfly's popcorn. Down the street, the band was playing a beautiful number, The Stars and Stripes Forever and people were walking past in front of us, going both ways, talking and laughing, and everybody seemed happy except us. That's a pretty band piece, Circus said. I always wanted to play in a band. Maybe someday I'll run away from home and get a job and make enough money to buy a cornet. 
Don't your mother like you anymore? Dragonfly asked. Circus kind of choked on the popcorn he had in his mouth and coughed a little. Then he said, Maybe if I ran away and got some work, I could send her the money I made. Just then, Circus's pa came shuffling down the street, laughing like a crazy man. And in a jiffy, Circus was out of his seat and running down an alley as fast as he could go, with us right after him, me thinking he, maybe he was going to run away right now, and not wanting him to, because I knew who his, how his mother would feel. In the alley about a block from the main street, we stopped behind somebody's garage where there wasn't any light, and listened for a minute to see if anybody was coming, and nobody was. He's mad at me, Circus said, because I went in there about a half an hour ago and told him to stop, or I'd tell Mother. He'll give me a terrible licking if he catches me. Right beside us was the telephone pole, and I couldn't help but think how if Circus was happy, he'd probably be halfway up to the top of it by now. There was the brightest, roundest moon up in the sky you ever saw, and if poetry had been happy, he'd probably have started to say, Hey, diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. We stayed there in the shadow of that little garage for maybe five minutes, thinking and saying different things, me wishing Circus was my brother, so he could have my pop for his daddy, when all of a sudden we heard footsteps coming down the alley. We crowded down a big box there and waited. And would you believe it? In a minute, two men stopped there in the dark, and one of them was my pop, and the other was Circus's. Say, you can guess we had a hard time keeping still, and I can't tell you how weird I felt inside. You're making a big fool out of yourself, my pop said disgustedly to Circus's pa. And Circus's pa swore terribly and said, I don't want any more kids. Three girls and one good-for-nothing boy is enough. Say, my fist doubled up when he said that, because I knew he was talking about Circus. And I reckon maybe it isn't wrong to get mad at something like that either. I peeped out from behind the box, and I could see my pop standing there tall and straight in the moonlight, looking so clean and good. And Circus's pa was standing all slouched over with his hat on crooked, and some of his mussed-up hair sticking out on one side. His tie was twisted, and his face, what I could see of it, looked terrible. And for a minute I remembered what Big Jim had said that afternoon about sin, quoting from the Bible, saying, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. I decided nobody could fool God. It was like my pop had just said, Circus's pa was making a big fool out of himself. Now you listen, Dan Brown, my pop said roughly. You're not doing another thing tonight, do you hear? It's none of your business, Circus's pop grumbled back and swore again. It's my money and I'll spend it like I please. Anyway, when a new baby comes to my house, I've got a right to celebrate. But say, my pop was getting angry too, with the right kind of anger. He just reached out his big, strong hands and grabbed Circus's paw by the shoulder and shook him like a big dog shakes a rat and said roughly, You ought to celebrate by getting down on your knees, Dan Brown, and praying to God Almighty that he'll forgive your sins and make you man enough to be a good father to your children and a decent husband to your wife. Mrs. Brown is one of the grandest little women that ever drew breath, and your boy is one of the finest boys in the country, and you... You're just a good for nothing. Shame on you, Dan Brown. And that's how we came to learn that Circus had a new baby at their house, too. Well, my pop wouldn't let Circus's pa go home that night, because he knew he'd cause all kinds of trouble if baby do something wrong. So he hunted up the town marshal, which is the same as a policeman, and they locked him up in jail, which is probably where he belonged. Also, that's how Circus came to stay all night at my house, because with the new baby coming to their house, there might be a lot of excitement, and Big Jim's mother was staying there too to help take care of the baby, so there wouldn't be beds enough. Although, as Circus said, 
he would just as leave sleep in the barn as he'd done it before when his pa was mad at him about something. Anyways, they wouldn't want a noisy boy around right away. My pop drove all the way home to Circus's house to tell them that Circus was going to sleep with me that night, his folks not having a telephone because his pa used all the money himself. Then Pop stopped at Big Jim's house and made arrangements for somebody to do the chores at circuses the next morning, Big Jim living right across the road from them anyway, as I told you before. Chapter 13 When we got back to my house, it was after 10 o'clock, more than an hour past the time I usually went to bed in the summer. You know, as poetry would say, in winter I get up at night and dress by yellow candlelight. In summer, quite the other way, I have to go be to bed by day. Charlotte Ann was wide awake when we came in and making a terrible noise, crying like everything. Circus and I went in for a minute to see what all the fuss was about and say that little thing stopped crying the minute we came in, or I should have said the minute she saw Circus. I know how to look at girls, he said to me, grinning. I've got three sisters. Four, I said. You're getting a new one at your house tonight. And he said, yeah, that's right. Kind of disappointed. Good night, I called to my mother in the other room. And then I looked at Miss Trillium, the nurse, with her pretty crimson cheeks and blue eyes and said, good night again. Special. She was holding a bottle with a nipple on it for Charlotte Ann, who was on her lap. And she looked up and smiled at me and said, good night, Bill. Circus said, good night, too, and she gave him a nice smile, but not nearly as nice as the one she'd given me, I thought. Then Circus and I went upstairs after watching Charlotte Ann drink her milk for a minute. Say, she was the cutest little thing. Even Circus looked at her like he thought so, too, and I got to thinking maybe he liked his little sisters better than he let on, most boys not wanting to let anybody know they liked girls at all, even when they did. Well, it didn't take us long to get undressed and ready for bed. Circus didn't seem very happy, and you couldn't really blame him. But in spite of that, he felt sorry for his pa. He's good to us sometimes, though, he said while we were undressing. One, last, one day last week, he told Ma he'd get better again, and I saw him give her a big hug like he really meant it. And Ma cried because she was so happy. But those old newspapers and magazines Pa reads have great big ads in them with important looking men doing wrong things and saying how good it is. And the first thing you know, Pa goes to town and does it again. You know what I wish, Circus said, and I could see he was getting mad at the people who made the stuff to begin with. I wish, he said with his fist doubled up and his voice trembly, I wish they'd just once take a picture of people like that and looking like he did uptown tonight and put that in their old papers and magazines. I bet that wouldn't make anybody ever want to buy any. Circus kept his fist doubled up and looked so fierce for a minute it almost scared me. But I was kind of proud of him that moment that he could get mad at something like that because it's all right to get angry at sin. My pop says so. And once even Jesus was angry at some people in the Bible who were doing wrong. And I guess maybe God hates sin terribly. Pretty soon we were in bed with the lamp out and the moonlight shining in on us. Then all of a sudden I remembered I hadn't said my prayers. In fact, I'd been thinking about it quite a little while and I didn't know what to do about it. I was sure Circus had never said prayers in his life. Because even if he did have a good mother, she wasn't a Christian yet, and she'd never taught him to pray. So I began to think that maybe I'd say my prayers in bed. But I remembered the story we'd read in school when, when we were in the fourth grade about little Arthur's prayer. And how that brave little fellow had knelt down before a whole room full of boys and prayed before going to bed. So I lay thinking wondering if Circus would make fun of me, and then I began to think about what little Jim would do even if he were there. And I knew that little fellow wouldn't even think about being afraid or ashamed. So pretty soon I decided on something, 
and say, talk about being brave in a fight or something. I guess I never had any harder time in my life being brave than right that minute. My heart started beating awful fast, and I was actually scared to do what I knew I had to do. I asked Circus if he remembered Little Arthur's prayer, and he did. Then I told him about poetry praying every night before he went to bed. I knew he liked poetry an, an awful lot, so pretty soon I said suddenly with my heart be still beating fast, let's us do it too. Not telling me I always did it every night anyway, although guess maybe I should have. Circus kind of grunted and then said, you go first. Well, in a jiffy, I was out of bed and saying my prayers quietly like I did sometimes anyway, knowing Jesus could hear me even if I didn't talk loud. I prayed for Circus's pa there, and I for his mother and for his new baby sister. Then I jumped up off my knees with my heart as light as a feather and said, I guess I feel better now. And then I climbed on into bed over on the other side of Circus. Circus lay there for about a half a minute, and in a jiffy there he was down on his knees right where I'd been, his brown hair shining in the moonlight. I guess I never did it. I guess I never did tell you Circus had the best brown hair any guy ever saw. And do you know, he had never prayed before in his whole life, and I never thought about him not knowing what to say. And all in a jiffy, he was through. He jumped up real quick, like, and said the same thing I'd said when I got up. I guess I feel better now. And jumped up into bed with his face turned away the other way on his pillow. After a while, I said to Circus, I prayed for your pa, and he didn't say anything. I wouldn't have found out how terribly he had felt about his pa if I hadn't kind of put my arm around him like boys do when they like each other a lot and felt a tiny little wet spot on his pillow, like maybe a tear or something had dropped there. But I didn't tell him I'd felt it. I just rolled over and said, good night. And pretty soon it was morning again, just like it was in Poetry's tent. And from that night on, Circus said his prayers every night. And the next time I saw little Jim, I told him about it, and he was so tickled he actually turned a somersault, just like Circus does. And there being a little tree right close by, he shinned up it just about as quick, quick as Circus could have done it. Chapter 14 when Circus and I woke up the next morning, the sun was already shining into our window, making a big yellow square on the green wallpaper just above the foot of the bed. We lay there for a minute before getting up, and I was looking at the sunlight, when all of a sudden there was a little shadow moving around in it, and I knew in a jiffy that it was a bird sitting on our windowsill, a sparrow maybe, preening his feathers and making funny little bird noises. His little head with his sharp little bill kept bobbing around kind of crazy-like, just like the bobber on my fishing line had done that day last week when I'd caught that big black bass. Oh, hum, I wished it had been two feet long. Say, that week was the most exciting week of my whole life, I reckon. Anyway, up to now, I thought. Circus let out a big yawn that scared the bird and it flew away. And just that man minute, Charlotte Ann started in crying downstairs. See there, you, I said to Circus, sitting up in bed and pretending to be angry. You woke her up. But he just grinned at me and said, I'll run downstairs and let her look at me, and she'll stop crying right away. He rolled out of bed and started dressing. Both of us dressed in about two jiffies, me putting on overalls so I could help Pop with the chores. That is, if they weren't already done. Then we went tumbling downstairs and out of doors, feeling like two frisky young colts. And just that minute, Circus saw our hot, big, high grape arbor with a cross piece at the top. And right there where there wasn't any vines was a good place to do athletic stunts. Quirking than anything, he was right up on it, skinning the cat and hanging, his, hanging by his legs and everything. Hey, I cried to him. You'll get your good clothes all wrinkled and dirty. He looked at me surprised-like, his face looking awful funny upside down, for he was still hanging by his legs, his brown hair all tangled up on top of his head. 
he got downright quick and said, that's right, I have to be careful. And he really meant it. But we had so many things for a boy to climb upon, such, the, such as the big cherry tree in our yard, the high rope swing in our walnut tree, and the ladder leading up into the haymow in our, in our barn, that I had to take Circus back upstairs to my room and get a pair of overalls for him, or his clothes wouldn't have been fit to wear to Sunday school at all. You see, I'd made up my mind he was going to Sunday school with me. I won't go to Sunday school with you, he said. My clothes aren't good enough for that. And he looked kind of sad again. Maybe he happened to think about his pa. I don't know, for he didn't act like circus after that, and I felt very sorry for him. Besides, he said, people will look at me and won't like me because of my pa. In any way, I haven't been to Sunday school since I was little. Well then, my, ju my pop just came out of the bar right then, barn right then with two big pails of milk, each one without a, about an inch of rich yellow foam on top of it. Why didn't you wake me up, I said to Pop, feeling guilty because I hadn't helped him. But Pop just laughed and said, You don't have company every day, so I decided to let you sleep, which I thought was pretty nice of him, don't you? Even if I didn't like to work, I like to help my Pop get the work done, because it's only good-for-nothing boys that won't help their parents without being scolded or whipped or something. After breakfast, Circus and I helped with the dishes, he doing it awkward-like because he had three sisters and didn't ever have to help at home. And who do you suppose washed those dishes? You'd never guess in the world, but my pop did. You should have seen him with Mom's big apron on, looking just like a woman unless he saw his big brown arms with the sleeves rolled up and his mustache and his reddish-brown hair, Mom's hair being almost black with little gray streaks in it. Maybe it might seem funny to some people to see a man washing dishes and boys wiping them. But say, when there's a swell new baby come to live at your house, you'd be willing to do almost anything to help take care of her. It's that important. Pretty soon it was time to go to Sunday school, and Circus still hadn't made up his mind to go. But we all told him his clothes looked good enough, and Pop gave him a brand new necktie to wear, saying he had too many now. I noticed especially that it was the one I'd give Pop, given Pop for his birthday two months ago, but I didn't say anything, being glad to let Circus have it. Just to keep him from feeling too embarrassed, I put on my second best shoes instead of my best, and he not having a good cap, we both went bareheaded. Besides, I told him, I'll bet Jesus didn't have a lot of fancy clothes to wear when he was a little boy, because his folks were poor. Were they, he asked, surprised. Sure, I said. And when he grew up, he didn't even have a nice home to live in, nor any money to pay, pay for things with at all. Why, one time he sent Peter down to the brook with his fishing pole and hook and told him he'd find the money to pay their taxes right in the fish's mouth, explaining that Jesus was trying to teach Peter that when he became a preacher later on, the people who got saved under his sermons would take care of him. Peter started in fishing for men long after that, you know. But Circus didn't quite understand what I was talking about, he not having heard the Bible explained very much. Is that in the Bible? he asked. We were standing up in our big high swing just then, facing each other and pumping ourselves higher and higher. Sure it is, I said. There's some of the best stories in the world right in the Bible. Do you suppose there'll be any jails in heaven, he asked. We were swinging off a high ride then, back and forth, the cool air blowing against our faces, our shirt sleeves flapping in the wind, our hair getting all mussed up and would have to be combed again before we could go to church. Jails, I said, trying to remember something I'd heard in our minister say. No, I don't think so. What would God want jails up there for? Circus didn't say anything for a minute, and then he asked, What'll he do with people that do the bad things? You know, I'd never thought about that before. I don't know, I said, thinking I'd ask my mom or pop or little Jim or somebody 
as soon as I got a chance. Then I happened to think of something important, and I didn't know whether it was right or not, but I asked little Jim the next day, and he said it was, I think maybe that all the people who aren't saved won't even get into heaven at all, but will have to go to, to that other place, I said to Circus. He looked awful sad for a minute, and we both forgot to pump and, pump and our swing almost stopped. And that's how I began to wonder whether I was saved myself or not. I knew I wasn't like Circus's pa or a bank robber or anything like that, but I felt right down in my heart that I needed Jesus anyway. For if people didn't need him, then why did he come all the way down here from heaven to die for them? But I didn't tell Circus how I felt just then, nor my pop, nor anybody. But I thought maybe sometime I'd tell little Jim, and I might even tell Jesus himself the next time I prayed. Well, pretty soon it was time to go to Sunday school, and away we went in Pop's car, stopping at Poetry's house for him and at Dragonfly's house for him. Big Jim and Little Jim were waiting for us in front of the church when we got there. We had the nicest teacher for our class. She knew all about boys, and you could tell by the way she looked at us that she liked us and wouldn't get angry if we forgot to listen for a minute or maybe whispered or something, it being especially hard for poetry to be good either in church or in school on account of him being so mischievous and couldn't help it. But even a mischievous boy can be good if he wants to. The only thing wrong with going to Sunday school on a hot day is that you have to wear shoes, and you keep wanting to take them off and go running lickety-sizzle through the woods, or go swimming or fishing or something. And if your teacher doesn't understand boys, it's still harder. Well, right after Sunday school, we all went outdoors a minute for some fresh air before the bell rang for church to begin, and then we went back inside. Every one of us stayed for church, too. Big Jim had given us a talk about that once. You see, one time last year when there had been a fire in our church, we all went to a Sunday school in town, and right after Sunday school was over, almost half of the other boys and girls went home, not even staying for church. Big Jim was disgusted, and little Jim thought it was terrible. Think of it, not staying for church service. Shucks, didn't those kids' parents know anything? Didn't they know that if you don't want a boy to grow up to be no good at all, maybe a gangster or something, he's got to go to Sunday school and church when he's little. Anybody ought to know that. Well, when my pop saw all of us boys sitting there in a row all by ourselves, with poetry and I sitting side by side, he gave me a look with his big eyebrows down that said, Now then, William Jasper Collins, you see to it that you don't get into any mischief. Maybe our pastor wasn't the one, most wonderful speaker in the world, and I couldn't understand everything he said, but he always had something in his sermon that a boy could understand, and that made it interesting. I guess he remembered when he was a boy, and couldn't understand everything either, unless it was explained in boy language. Anyway, his sermons helped you to love Jesus a little more, and when he told an interesting story to explain some Bible verse, I always sat up and listened, even if I had been wiggling around a little bit before that. Well, the music started, and we were all singing away, poetry growling along try to sing bass, and couldn't on account of his voice being just half soprano and half something else. When somebody's baby started to cry, and I forgot all about that song and everything for thinking of Charlotte Ann. Say, I looked at Circus, and he looked at me, and then he looked at the baby just like he had done at Charlotte Ann that night, but it didn't do a bit of good. <clears throat> In fact, the baby cried even louder than before. And for a minute, I had a hard time to keep from laughing. But pretty soon, they took the baby out, like you're supposed to do when they won't quit crying in church, and everything was all right. They finished the song and were starting another, when all of a sudden the door opened and somebody came in and started walking down the aisle toward the front of the church. And would you believe it? It was old man Paddler himself, his long white hair combed nice and neat. 
He had a good suit of clothes on, and he was walking pretty spry for such an old man, looking just like Moses or somebody. I tell you, we all sat up and took notice, and for a minute the singing almost stopped. Little Jim's mother, who was playing the piano, turned halfway around and actually struck some of the wrong keys for a minute. Our minister must have known him, for after looking surprised a minute, he came right down off the platform and went to him and shook hands with him, smiling all over like he was his very best friend. Then he whispered something in the old man's ear like he was asking a question, and I saw that old head nod like he was saying yes. Then we went on singing. Well, pretty soon I knew what our minister had asked him, for when we'd finished the song and we'd finished reading some verses out of the Bible, he said, I'm sure we are all happy to have one of our charter members with us this morning, after a trip around the world, one whom many of you have known and loved. At this time we shall be led in prayer by Seneth Padler. Well, that old man just lifted his fine old gray head toward the ceiling with his face looking up, only his eyes were shut, and his kind old face started in praying, trembling along like it wasn't very strong and might break any time. I shut my eyes like you're supposed to when anybody prays, and for a minute it was almost scary in that church, because it kind of seemed like heaven had moved right down to earth, and I actually had to open my eyes to be sure it wasn't so. And say that old man's white forehead was shining, and his long whiskers looked awful pretty. I actually kept my eyes open almost all the rest of the way through that prayer, forgetting to close them. And do you know what? It's a secret, and I never told anybody before. But just as old man Padler was finishing his prayer, I shut my eyes real quick and told Jesus I loved him, and I asked him to come into my heart for sure so I'd know whether I was saved or not. Then I prayed real quick for Circus's paw, and got done at the same time old man Padler did. And do you know what else? It kind of seemed from that minute on that Jesus and me had a secret, and that that was that I was an honest-to-goodness Christian, and that maybe someday Circus's paw would be saved, and Circus wouldn't have to run away because his paw would be good to him, and he could have a cornet and play in the band, and his mother would be happy, and they'd all go to church like families are supposed to do. Well, then the meeting was over, and we went home, Circus riding home with Big Jim and his folks. After dinner was over at our house, and when I saw Pop get his big black Bible and go out to the car, I knew he was going down to the downtown to talk to Circus's pa. So I ran down to the barn and climbed up into our haymow, and went away back up in the hay where nobody could see me or even hear me, and got down on both of my knees and told Jesus about our secret, and asked him to help my pop and to make that part of the secret about Circus's pa come true just as quick as he could. Then to make it seem like a bargain, I just stuck my little New Testament there in a crack in a log and left it. You see, I still had it in my pocket from carrying it to Sunday school, and all of a sudden I began to be awful happy, because it seemed like Jesus had forgiven all my sins, and that he had really and truly saved me. I even cried a little bit all by myself, and I didn't care if I did, and I loved Jesus so much inside that it seemed my heart would burst. Then I climbed down out of the haymow, and asked at the, there at the bottom of the ladder was old Mixie, our black and white cat. And I felt so good, I just scooped her up in my arms and hugged her and yelled, Whoopee! But say, Mixie didn't seem to appreciate the fact that I was happy, for she got scared when I yelled. She scrambled out of my arms and went lickety-sizzle across the floor and crawled into a hole that leads under the barn. Then I went up to the house to see Charlotte Ann and maybe do a little errand or something for Miss Trillium, if she wanted me to, and to wait for Dragonfly who had promised to come over to play with me that afternoon. And that is the end of our chapter for tonight. Looks like tomorrow night we have chapter 15 and 16, and that will finish our book. I will see you again tomorrow evening.